Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening for the fourth talk in the geology lecture series this year. Uh, I think we're in for quite a treat this evening, and I'm glad that you all had an opportunity to make it out through rain and sleet and hail, and that I got to go through rain, sleet, hail, snow, and about 14 other precipitations that I don't recognize to pick up our speaker this morning and get him here in one piece and also to see a little bit of Shore Acres, so that's a, a wonderful thing. Uh, if you didn't pick it up, the last two talks, I've got a little bit of information out there in the lobby that you're welcome to pick up. If you didn't sign one of these handy dandy little sheets on your way out, if you would just take a second to do that. Uh, part of putting this series on for free is the old justification line. And so trying to make sure that uh, sponsors and potential sponsors know how many people actually attend the lectures is a imp very important thing. Speaking of sponsors, the SWAC Foundation is a contributor, as is the college, by giving us this wonderful space. And thank you guys for coming in on a Saturday night, as usual, uh, for giving us some tech support as well. And also to Oregon Resources Corporation, our main financial sponsor as well. So... I had this talk, I'll dial, yeah, hearing that, if you have an electronic device, if you would please take a moment to turn it off now. Uh, I was, had this talk all dialed in, and a couple of you got the few copies of Dirt, the erosion of civilization that we had available as a lecture series fundraiser, uh, and I had Dave all set to come and talk about Dirt. And Dirt's his more, more recent book and has a new one coming out this summer. But I was out fishing with a good close friend of mine, and I saw over 200 boats out there. It's like, well, he wrote King of Fish, too, and the history of salmon, and a discussion of salmon. No. Uh, and so part of that ended up being, I was thinking, why am I having him talk about dirt when salmon play such an important role historically in our neighborhood, going back to Native American culture and even our present day? And so it's like, would you mind changing dirt to king of fish? And he loves both topics. So he's like, sure, no problem. So after the talk, if you're interested, we're selling copies of King of Fish that Dave would be pleased to sign for you in the lobby after the talk as a lecture series fundraiser. So we've got a number of copies out there. Uh, just see us out at the table. So Dave's history went to Stanford as an undergrad, went to uh, UC Berkeley as a graduate student, and part of that time at Berkeley also had him in Coos Bay for some short as well extended periods of time working on Metman Ridge, looking at landslides. So as a geomorphologist, he's dealing with a lot of very different topics, including the relationship between landscapes, change, and salmon. It's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight Dave Montgomery. Great, uh, Ron, thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, also uh, for everyone for coming tonight and for the opportunity to come back to Coos Bay because this is actually one of the places where I cut my geomorphological teeth. In graduate school, I was working on a project up on Metman Ridge and uh, came back. I spent a, pretty much a decade visiting Coos Bay off and on on that study. and So it, it really is a personal pleasure to be back here tonight. Um, well. One of the questions that I've gotten about King of Fish uh, from a number of corners, not the least of which are my biologist colleagues, are why would a geologist write a book about fish? I hope that by the end of the talk tonight, it's really clear why someone like myself would sort of be uh, uh, willing to take that on in sort of a different field. And, and the, the real reason is that it's not that different a field. If we look at the way that people influence the way landscapes evolve today, the kind of things we do to the way water and sediment move around the surface of the earth, it really is reshaping the way that habitats for different kinds of organisms, and there's no better poster child than salmon for this problem, um, have reshaped quite literally the world of the, some of the species that we share this planet with. Um, so what I want to give you tonight is sort of the, the view of a ge how a geologist who studies what you might consider the here and now of geology, the sort of the, the forces that shape the surface of the earth that, that we live on and know, 
Um, how one approaches that problem and how one looks at the way that some of our actions can influence things that we might not have intended to be influenced by them. Um, and that's sort of the common theme to both King of Fish and to Dirt. I'll make a shameless plug at the end of the talk for my new book, but I'll save the topic for that later. Um, let's get into the salmon. Uh, and what I want to start with is a, a figure by one of my favorite artists, the Alaskan artist Ray Troll, and it's essentially the salmon phylogeny or the salmon family tree. And I'm showing it to you because it's one of the, the things that I think a geologist can really weigh in on is a question that really bothered me when I moved to the Northwest and started studying rivers and streams and started running into the salmon that were in them. And what bothered me is why is there a single species of Atlantic salmon? If you go to Europe, you go to New England, you go to Canada uh, on the East Coast, there's a single species all across that wide geography. You go to the Pacific and there's a whole bunch of different kinds of species of salmon. Um, Chinook, coho, chum, pink, sockeye salmon, the now extinct saber-tooth salmon that got up to 10 or 12 feet long, weighed about 300 pounds, had big pointy teeth, um, and actually went extinct before we evolved as a species. So the one species that we know of, of salmon, that has gone extinct so far in the history of the world is one that we have absolutely no blame uh, for at all. Our conscience is clear. They disappeared before we arrived. In fact, they disappeared. The probability is that they essentially blinked out as the uh, glacial advances of the ice ages started to reshape the world about five, six million years ago and then really sped up in the last few million years. But that's sort of a tangent. They're the one extinct one, but why are there, there five species of Pacific salmon, a sixth if you look at the Asian salmon, and only one species of Atlantic salmon? This is a problem that really bothered me as a geologist. Um, and so I started to think about it, put it together, and if you look at the paleontological history, the fossil evidence for salmon, about 20 million years ago, there was an ancestral salmon. Um, and that by about six million years ago, all the modern species of Pacific salmon, including the extinct saber-toothed salmon, were already in existence. We know this from because there's fossils of all those species. So between 20 million and 6 million years ago, something happened in the Pacific that was different than in the Atlantic. And it really bothered me as to what that might be for the simple reason that the classical explanation for that problem, why there was a diversity of Pacific salmon and only a single kind of Atlantic salmon, was that in the biological literature, um, the classical hypothesis was that the fish were isolated during glacial advances, that during the glacial advances and retreats of the last few million years, pockets of fish would be isolated for long enough that they could diverge reproductively from, from their neighbors and be off on a trajectory to form new species. The problem, of course, is that Europe was glaciated, New England was glaciated, all around the Pacific uh, and the Atlantic was glaciated. There was nothing sort of different between the glaciations in the Atlantic and on the Pacific side that would lead you to ask the question of, well, why did it, you get a diversity of salmon in the Pacific? I then started looking into the salmon paleontology because that first part bothered me and I realized that, well, the fossil salmon of all the major species predate the onset of the glaciations. And this is a fundamental problem for the classical explanation that the ice blocking the salmon caused them to radiate into the modern species we know for the very simple reason that it's only on Star Trek that things that happened after something else could then go back in time and influence the thing from before. I mean, we live in a unidirectional world of time. Things that happened after something else couldn't have caused the, the first thing. Uh, and so glaciations could not be it. So the problem, of course, was one that's very typical in the sciences, is that people in different disciplines weren't talking to each other. The biologists were not talking to the paleontologists. And if you read both their literature, you could kind of go, oh, wait a minute, we have a problem here. Um, so what was it that actually caused the evolution of the Pacific salmon? Well, I, being a geologist, of course, I came up with a geological idea. Um, and that idea was that if you look at this time in which the Pacific salmon evolved, between 20 million and 6 million years ago, it's a period of time known as the Miocene. It's a period of time in which there was tremendous physiographic change in Western North America. Um, many of the mountain ranges that we know today uh, as high mountains, the Alaska Range, the Cascades, uh, uh, big parts of the Oregon Coast Range, the Northern California Coast Ranges, um, they were, uh, the Olympic Mountains in particular, were places that up until the Miocene had been broad low coastal plains or marine environments in some cases. Um, but they all were uplifted. They became the topography we know today in this same window of time in the Miocene. So the radiation of Pacific salmon, their development into different species, coincides with the uplift of topography around the western edge of North America. In other words, there was a tectonic shift 
in Western North America that created different environments that I believe that the fish actually radiated into, started using differently, started to isolate themselves. We all know that salmon fairly, but not completely, faithfully go back to their home stream to spawn. And by creating new and different environments, steep channels as well as gentle ones, where before they had been all gentle, they were able to essentially segregate out into using different parts of watersheds. And if you look at where salmon use rivers and streams today, uh, they overlap in that they all swim up from, from the sea, but they tend to segregate out into different areas of watersheds, not 100%, but fairly well. And I was basically arguing that this is not a coincidence. And, and no, I'm not arguing that the evolution of salmon caused the uplift of the mountains. <laughs> That would have been a really, really tremendous finding. Um, but I was arguing that the uplift of the mountains along the Pacific Rim led to the diversity of salmon that we have today. And, and what that means, of course, is that at a very fundamental level, if I'm right at that, and I had, the hypothesis has been out for about 12 years now, and seems to be holding its own in terms of the paleontological community, um, and geologists really love to argue with each other, so you know, it's, it's off to a good start. Um, but the... Uh, um, it's an idea that I think uh, really illustrates that at a core level, the Pacific salmon and the topography of the Northwest co-evolved. They really are adapted um, to life in this region. Um, and I want to share with you for the next couple minutes a really spectacular fossil find of salmon that happened on the Olympic Peninsula. So Seattle's over here somewhere. Um, uh, this is the Olympic Peninsula. There's a river called the Skokomish River that flows out of the Olympics where if you blow this little red box up over here and look at this geological map, uh, which I'll, I'm, I'm not going to explain all the uh, 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 stuff on it to you for the moment, except that this black line is the limit of the ice advance during the last glaciation, which is this black line as well. Some fishermen at this fi lake locality here labeled fossil salmon found some fossil sockeye salmon eroding out of a riverbank. And one of the real problems with looking at salmon paleontology is that there's not much of a fossil record. That beautiful Ray Troll figure that I showed you is actually based, it's, there's not a lot behind it, it's pretty solid, but it's not, there's not um, a tremendous record of salmon in the paleontological record for a very simple reason. Think about where salmon die. They tend to die in mountain streams, upland streams. They die in places that aren't preserved in the geologic record. Most of what we know about life on this planet and its history comes from marine sediments, from sediments, things that die in the ocean and get preserved, um, particularly when they're shoved then back up on land by tectonics where we can find them. Um, but the salmon that die in the ocean tend to be eaten by something else. They get reprocessed into some other life form before they would be preserved. So there's not a tremendous reservoir of fossil salmon on the planet. And these fishermen on the Skokomish River basically found these absolutely gorgeous two-foot-long sockeye salmon eroding out of the riverbank and had the good sense to call the local timber company that owned the land that they were on, who basically called this fish biologist who called me, who told them to call the Burke Museum, because I didn't know how to collect fossils and actually not destroy them, since uh, it does take specialized training to do it. But they basically um, found these two foot long so uh, fossil salmon. You can see its head here, the beautiful vertebra. Uh, these things are in the Burke Museum, um, and they're basically virtually unique. They're the only fossil salmon that I know of that have been found in western Washington. And we were able to determine that they're a four-year-old spawning population. If you look at the fish, uh, their tails were worn away as if they had just spawned. Uh, you could uh, analyze the rings on their, um, on their growth rings. They were four years old. They'd been to the marine environment and back. You could analyze the isotopic composition of their bones. And so we know that they were anadromous, that they went from freshwater to the marine environment and back because of their isotopic composition. We know that they were sockeye, which if you recall from that Ray Troll figure, are the most recently evolved but still living um, species of salmon. And we know that they were a million years old. Why? Well, because there was volcanic ash buried in the same beds as the fossil fish. So we have very solid evidence that all the modern salmon existed at least a million years ago in Washington state. Um, and therefore we know that they were actually fairly well adapted to life in the rivers and streams of the Northwest, which are actually fairly dynamic and disturbance-rich environments. You know, Mount St. Helens incinerating the Toodle River downstream of it is an extreme example, but within five years, salmon were nosing back up the Toodle River and recolonizing it. You know, not even St. Helens could wipe them out. Um, 
And we also know that, that salmon thrive for millions of years despite the landscape shaped by floods, volcanic eruptions, and natural disturbances. And that life history strategy of spending several years out in the marine environment is a really good strategy if you think about how to survive as a species in a stream that might be wiped out by big floods every few years or every few centuries or millennia by a volcano because you have a reservoir of colonists out in the marine environment that can do what the fish did on the Toodle River and come back. So the salmon are very well adapted to life in a disturbance-rich and disturbance-prone environment, which characterizes rivers and streams of the Northwest. We also know that um, salmon in the Northwest were able to survive fairly intensive Native American predation for thousands of years. There was a very intensive fishery, particularly on the Columbia River. It's estimated that something on the order of perhaps 20, 25 percent of the salmon in the Columbia were taken by Native Americans for at least 9,000 years, 9,300 years. And if that's not the definition of a sustainable fishery, I don't know what actually would be, um, because that's longer than agricultural civilization has been in existence. Um, so we can, we can be fairly certain that uh, salmon can survive fairly intensive human predation because the experiment has been run and run successfully uh, in the Northwest. But if we look at the status of salmon populations today, uh, this basically shows you the reconstructions that uh, Gretsch, Lickitouch, and Schoonmaker did back uh, a little over a decade ago, where they looked at the, the run size in different regions as a percent of the historical run size. So if you look at Alaska up here at 106 percent, it's basically Alaska has about as much salmon as we think they had circa 1900, 1920. Uh, and they've had a fairly intensive fishing industry up there for a century. So uh, we could return to that if we wanted. But uh, look at British Columbia. They have about a third of the salmon that they thought they did. Uh, Puget Sound, the area where I live, or the state of Washington, were down under 10 percent. Uh, the Columbia Basin is less than 2% wild salmon. Oregon, you're sort of, Oregon and California and Washington are all in about the same boat. We got about less than 1 out of 10 of the salmon that we're pretty sure we had historically that we still have today. So we've lost something on the order of 90% of our um, salmon fisheries over the last um, a century and a half. What happened? Well, the, f the standard explanation is essentially what we call the four H's of harvest or overfishing, habitat, uh, hydropower, and hatcheries, sort of hu the way human actions have influenced salmon runs. And I was advised by uh, numerous colleagues not to use the four H's in writing King of Fish because they were convinced that the four H club would sue me out of existence. Um, when I alerted my publisher to that concern, they were like, great, bring it on, that's free publicity. Um, <laughs> So you have very different perspectives uh, on this. Um, and I'm not going to talk about all four of these H's in equal detail tonight. Uh, why not? Well, I'm a geologist. I can actually tell you a lot about the changes in habitat over the last century and a half. In writing King of Fish, I had to research the effects of, of uh, fishing uh, dams and hatchery practices. But the last time that I really talked in, at length in public about hatcheries in the Northwest, the Nisqually earthquake took two chimneys off my house like an hour later. So I'm just not going to do that again. <laughs> and besides, the real point that I want to make is about what I call the fifth H, or history. Because uh, as I started looking into the history of salmon, uh, I noticed strikingly different, uh, a strikingly similar pattern of changes to river systems and salmon crises in Great Britain, New England, and now the Pacific Northwest. Uh, why did I start looking into the history of, uh, of salmon and human interactions with salmon? Well, I used to be the vice chairman of the um, interdisciplinary science panel charged with evaluating the state of Washington's salmon recovery plans. And one of the first things we did at the meetings of that panel, which has been disbanded by the state legislature because we kind of came up with the wrong answers apparently a few too many times. Um, but the, uh, one of the things that we asked was, has anybody looked back at what happened in New England or in England to their salmon and their manage, the management of salmon? To, to simply, are there lessons that we might be able to get from looking at history that might help us prevent repeating some of those um, experiments if they didn't turn out as well as I was afraid they might have. And basically the looks we got back from um, you know, the state officials that we were dealing with was, a, there were salmon in New England? What are you talking about? I mean, there was absolutely no sort of institutional memory or knowledge that there actually had been very large runs of salmon in New England and in, in Europe before that. 
So I basically, uh, you know, geology is one of the historical sciences. It involves both studying processes and history, earth history. Um, and being historically inclined, I decided to start looking into, well, what had happened in Europe? What had happened in New England? And, and were their experiences at all relevant to thinking and arguing about what's happening to salmon in the Northwest today? So I want to take the next couple minutes to share with you sort of how far back in time I can trace three out of those four ages. Then, you know, I've already mentioned that I'm not going to talk about the fourth. Uh, but what about harvest? Well, there's an earliest recorded salmon fishing legislation that I can dig up was an edict issued by King Malcolm II of Scotland that in 1030 established a closed season for taking old salmon. In other words, a thousand years ago in Scotland, the country you know, with a name like Montgomery, that's, you know, that's where my ancestors came from. Um, and what did you eat in Scotland if you were not part of the nobility? And I'm pretty certain my ancestors were not. Um, you essentially ate salmon. Uh, there's not much else to eat in the Scottish landscape. Um, but um, salmon would swim back up the rivers there. It was free. You could take them. And it was viewed as the king's business, the monarch's business, to essentially protect the salmon fishery. And the, part of the deal was is that if the fish made it back to their spawning beds, you had to let them go. You could fish for them on the way up, but if they made it back to spawn, they were off limits. Why? Well, they understood that you had to let the fish reproduce for there to be more fish in the future. I mean, it's, it's not, we didn't need science to actually explain that to us. It was known a thousand years ago. Um, in terms of the habitat age, uh, there was a statute dating from the reign of Richard the Lionhearted that declared that the rivers of England must be kept free of obstructions so as to permit a well-fed three-year-old pig standing sideways in the stream not to touch either side. <laughs> You had to leave a hole in the river. You had to let the water be able to go freely down to the ocean and the fish to go freely back up to their native stream. Why? Well, again, they knew that for the fish to complete their life cycle, they needed to be go to the marine environment and to make it back to their stream. And if you built something that stopped them from doing that, you lost your fish. It's that simple with salmon. Um, and so this is in, the, I believe, the 12th or 13th century. I'm, I'm sort of forgetting the dates on these now. Um, but in terms of the hydrodam, expli or H, explicitly looking at the role of dams on salmon, there was an act passed in the reign of King Robert I, Robert the Bruce of Scotland, in 1318, that forbade the erection of fixtures of any size or dimensions that would prevent the progress of salmon up or down a river. Again, they knew that you had to let the fish have the free access to complete their life cycle to maintain the fishery, which was feeding my ancestors. Well, over time, that worked uh, for you know, literally about 800 years. It was illegal in England to block a salmon-bearing river in a way that would prevent the progress of a salmon up or down the river. And yet, by 1714, King George I of England enacted a law to prevent the blocking of their spawning grounds in 17 English rivers. Well, it had already been illegal to do that for about 700 years. So what, what had happened? Essentially, every time the administration changed in, in England, um, there was a bit of a power dynamic where um, the new monarch basically grandfathered in all the dams that had been built under the previous administration. Um, and why was this done? Well, because the only people who were actually damming the streams were the, the sort of lesser noble, nobility who had the capital to actually dam streams, the very people that the new monarch needed the support of. Um, so there's this political dynamic that essentially led to the progressive damming of rivers and streams throughout England, even though it was illegal the entire time that by about 1714, you were getting up to probably 60, 70% of the river miles of England couldn't, hold, uh, uh, couldn't pass uh, support salmon. By the 19th century, it got even higher than that. Because um, by 1868, all of those 17 rivers pr uh, protected explicitly by George I uh, were either blocked or poisoned by pollution. They could no longer support salmon. Um, so by the late 19th century, something like 90% of the river miles of England that had formerly been salmon habitat could not support salmon they lost 90% of their fish. This is starting to sound perhaps relevant to the Northwest. Well, while I was sitting on the ISP, I also managed to buy a book off of eBay for, I think I paid 50 bucks for it, but frankly, I, it's long ago enough now that I don't remember. It was written in 1833. I do remember that nobody else bothered to bid on it because it was about, it was by a, a Scottish gamekeeper named Alexander Fraser, who was basically proposing how to save the English salmon. And I brought this book to an ISP meeting and sort of showed people, hey, you know, the things you guys are still arguing about, this guy had proposed the solution 200 years ago. <laughs> Why are we still arguing about it? He, because he said that it's actually fairly simple to save the salmon of England. You, we need to not block the ability of salmon to migrate or up or downstream, manage the hydro age, 
limit fishing intensity so as not to take the majority of the spawners, manage the harvest age, in other words, don't take more than half the fish and they'll actually reseed the streams just fine, and prevent habitat degradation that could damage the fishery, manage the habitat age. In terms of these three H's, this last one at the bottom is probably the one we've learned the most about in the last 200 years. The upper two, you know, they were common sense a thousand years ago. But we were still arguing about them in Washington about a decade ago. But that's, I'll, I'm going to try not to pick on my home state too much on this lecture. That would just be wrong. Uh, but so let's leave England aside uh, because the, um, the, uh, the state of the English salmon is, is nothing to brag about today, shall we say. Let's look at New England because there are stories in New England that you can find in reading through the colonial records uh, that really parallel some of the stories that you read about from the early colonization of the Northwest. Uh, one of the, the, the most interesting I found was by a guy named Nicholas Denis, one of the early governors of French Arcadia in, in modern Canada, who wrote that if the pigeons plagued us by their abundance, and of course these are the now extinct passenger pigeons, uh, if the pigeons plagued us by their abundance, the salmon gave us even more trouble. So large a quantity of them enters into the river that at night one is unable to sleep, so great is the noise they make in falling upon the water after having thrown or darted themselves into the air. Salmon in colonial New England were a nuisance. They were a nuisance because most of the early visitors were fishermen who were after cod. And why were they after cod? Well, you could basically catch a lot of cod, salt them, put them in a barrel, ship it back to England, and make enough money to keep your, your crew fed and your ship provisioned and go back and forth across the Atlantic uh, to, to do it again. There were still enough salmon in England at that time that salmon was not a commercially viable fishery in the New World. Um, but there were so many fish in that, well, where would fishermen camp, make their camps? Along the freshwater rivers, because that's where they get fresh water. In the spawning season, they couldn't sleep. There were so many fish uh, spawning and, and bothering them. So salmon were a, a tremendous nuisance. Uh, they were used as fertilizer. Uh, they were not valued early on in the colonies. Later on, they became an, an interesting fishery. Uh, but today, of course, the salmon of New England are a nuisance for a completely different reason. And that reason is called the Endangered Species Act. Um, this map is a map of the rivers of New England. Well, it looks like a map of the rivers of New England. What it actually is, is it's a map of the rivers of New England from which salmon have been extirpated. This is an extinction map. Um, you'll notice that the salmon used to get down here to Connecticut. They ranged all the way up into Canada. Uh, there's a couple rivers in these gaps in here in Maine where there still are wild Atlantic salmon. But frankly, the escapees from fish farms on the East Coast outnumber the wild fish in the rivers about 100 to 1. Um, and so. What happened in New England? Well, it was really kind of a parallel story to what happened in England before that. Uh, this is a, a map that shows you from Maine up here down to um, uh, down through New England, uh, showing you the density of mill dams that were built during the early part of the Industrial Revolution. Um, it had been it was illegal to dam a river in New England dating back from 1709 in a way that would prevent the progress of a fish, a salmon in particular, up or down a river. Yet over the course of the next uh, virtually 200 years, um, the construction of extensive mill dams throughout New England systematically blocked off river after river such that by the end of the 19th century, um, something like 90% of the river miles of New England were physically inaccessible to a salmon. The very similar story that happened in England. The first laws outlawing blocking salmon, uh, uh, bl outlawing salmon blocking dams date from 1709, as I said. And between 1820 and 1880, there were over 150 fishery laws relating to salmon passed in the state of Maine alone. Uh, in other words, the plight of the salmon in New England by the late 19th century was not due to a lack of laws. There had always been illegal to block a salmon-bearing stream in New England in a way that prevented fish from going up or downstream. And yet, over the course of about a century, 90% of the river miles were blocked. Well, what was the problem? Well, enforcement was virtually non-existent. There's wonderful stories about, uh, one of which I included in King of Fish, about a magistrate who, who received a report of uh, poachers taking salmon up um, you know, where they weren't supposed to in a river, and he sent out his deputies who managed not to find any poachers, but they brought back 20 salmon. Um, so what are the common themes that I can find in the story of salmon in England and in New England uh, that might have some relevance for the salmon um, in the Northwest? Um, well, historically, local control and lax enforcement really went hand in hand. And now, I'm not trying to argue that local involvement or stakeholder input or even local control is a bad thing. But if you look back through the history of it, um, there's an awful lot of precedent for 
other economic priority uh, interests being prioritized over the interests of the salmon fishery for different reasons historically and different times and places, but that local decisions often shortchange the fishery in the, in the long run. Now, by the same token, the few examples you can find of very successful salmon recovery efforts were entirely driven by local efforts. So this is not to basically say that local efforts involvement is bad, but lax enforcement has been at the heart of the decline of many salmon runs. The gradual accumulation of many individual habitat impacts, though that sort of damming of the river miles so that 90% were dammed, uh, didn't happen overnight. It happened a few percent every decade. And if you think like a geologist, you know, if you dam 10% of your river miles every decade, it only takes a century until you've dammed them all. And so slow changes, as long as they're always in the same direction, eventually can add up to large impacts. And that's sort of a fundamental uh, uh, lesson of a geological worldview. The over-reliance on hatcheries at the expense of habitat, and well, hopefully my chimneys will still be in my house when I get home now that I've said it, um, but that's part of the record as well, and a lack of long-term planning and understanding of habitat fish linkages. And I want to focus the rest of the talk really on what we've learned in the Northwest in trying to study some of these habitat fish linkages, um, because that's where a geologist like myself can actually sort of weigh in and attempt to try and frame issues or provide advice about how we might go about restoring commercially viable salmon fisheries throughout the Northwest, which is something I personally would love to see happen and believe can happen, um, but it's going to take some time. So the question, of course, is how well have we learned these lessons in the Northwest? And the secondary question, of course, is how often do you see the Statue of Liberty holding a salmon up? Not very often. Um, okay, well, in terms of the harvest age, it's really not worth arguing about, in my view, that early 20th century harvest practices were not sustainable. We took something like 90 percent uh, the Chinook runs each year off the Columbia River, and within a couple of decades, uh, most of the ones are gone. There's a, the fishing records are, are complete enough that we can basically say that early 20th century fishing was wildly unsustainable. And yet, if you look at Alaska, they had, you know, it doesn't look like they've had evidence of long term loss. So the problem isn't simply commercial fishing, it may be how we've done it. And in particular, the early, in the early cannery days, it was overdone in the lower 48. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. I'll not be looking at or critiquing modern salmon fishing uh, regulations. Why? Well, because I'm a geologist. I don't do that part. Um, if we look at the hydro H, again, the Columbia River is probably the poster child for the impacts of uh, dams on salmon runs. Um, the, the sort of novel idea that you could just sort of barge them around the dam is to remind me that the problem of getting salmon over the dams was recognized when the dams were built. And if you actually go and read the sort of congressional testimony, there's very interesting arguments about, okay, how could we build fish ladders to, to get the adult fish over the dams? And you know, some were built too large to have ladders. Others were built with very nice fish passage facilities. The problem was how to get the juvenile fish down the river, it turns out. Because the Columbia, if you imagine how a, a small salmon is going to make it down the Columbia to the estuary, the Columbia is a big river. They basically surfed the current. They weren't swimming, they were just floating and the river took them down. They were genetically programmed to essentially mature into saltwater fish by the amount of time it would take to float in an actively free flowing river. Um, and turning the river into a series of lakes meant they had to swim all the way down. And not only swim, but on more than one occasion swim through turbines. And I actually visited one of the, the um, dams in the Columbia once and sort of asked how many of the fish sort of survive through the dam. And they were sort of like, oh, well, like 90% survive through. And I said, well, and how many dams are there? Um, and it's 90% in each one. And if you go down and add it up, it starts to become big numbers. They stopped answering my questions on that tour after I, the second question. Um, but in terms of the salmon landings on the Columbia, you know, basically, uh, uh, the fishing records started to be kept uh, circa about 18, the 1870s. Fishing pressure ramped up. It oscillated by about 50% uh, over sort of a multi-year cycle. This probably, in my mind, represents sort of the innate variability of a salmon fishery. Marine conditions matter an awful lot. It's not sort of a sta stable level. But once the dam started to be built, the fishery basically started to collapse. Um, and I know that correlation does not indicate causality, but I think this is a pretty good case where they're pretty tied together. Um, but let's talk about habitat, because to me as a geologist, as a geomorphologist, as somebody who stover, studies rivers and streams and what shapes and forms them, therein lies some of the real interesting and surprising connections between the state of rivers, human activity, and the ability of those rivers to support salmon. 
One of the things that we really need to start out with is that the trees that we see in the Northwest today are not necessarily those that were here before. Um, big trees, such as we had in the Northwest, really influenced even big rivers. The, uh, the Wilkes Report that was written in 1844 describing the Columbia River actually describes the way these giant old growth logs floating down the Columbia River, the fourth largest river in North America, the biggest one in this region, how those snags would ground out in the estuary of the Columbia and islands would form behind them. The big trees in this region were reshaping even the biggest rivers in the region. Um, and a geologist like me which studies this kind of a problem, the way uh, rivers create habitat through what I call a horrendogram, um, because this is what my students call it. Um, and this is basically meant to walk you through how a geologist like myself would look at how the supply and transport of water, sediment, and wood interact to structure salmon habitat. And it basically is set up so that you have inputs up here on the first line. And what goes into a river? Well, it's water, it's sediment, sort of mud and silt and sand, coarse sediment, gravel, large woody debris, logs and trees. And you have the processes that actually move that material around to create uh, to flood the floodplains, to move sediment, to cause bank erosion, the, w the way that things actually create the forms, the floodplain, the floodplains, the side channels, the bars, pools, and riffles that collectively define the morphology of a channel that once you put an organism into it, forms habitat. And that could either be the rearing habitat for salmon, places that they hang out and grow and eat, or spawning habitat where the gravel is, and that then, of course, influences salmon. So this kind of a horrendogram is a way to track, if we change any of these things at the top line, how is that going to cascade down through all these causal relations and influence the, the thing of interest at the bottom? And we could make a separate horrendogram for any individual species, but I'm interested in talking about salmon. So. Most geomorphologists recognize the changes in water and sediment. We've learned a lot in the last couple of decades about the way that the changes in the trees that were falling into the rivers historically or that fall into them now probably fundamentally changed the way that the rivers and streams can support salmon. Well, in the 1880s, um, the Army Corps of Engineers started pulling out the large uh, snags out of Puget Sound rivers. This shows you a, a big snag that's being pulled, a, a tree trunk with a root ball being pulled by one of the snag boats. Uh, these snag boats came to the Northwest after they finished up cleaning the rivers of the American South. They were originally built as part of reconstruction after the Civil War to clean up the rivers of the South and open avenues of commerce because in the 19th century, rivers were the highways of today. Um, that was how you moved people and goods up and down and through a landscape. And as part of the effort to develop the Northwest, uh, the rivers were, uh, snags were pulled out of the rivers. This shows you how many were pulled out of the Puget Sound rivers per year from 1880 to 1960. And you'll notice that the axis is in thousands of these really large trees. They only recorded the ones that were bigger than a meter or two in diameter. They were routinely pulling five meter diameter logs out of the rivers and streams. And if those kind of logs were reshaping the Columbia, what were they doing to the smaller rivers? Well, that's actually a really hard question to answer. But um, there's actually one place around Puget Sound that really helped us study that problem. And that problem was uh, the Nisqually River uh, and its floodplain. This is a vertical aerial photograph looking down as if you're in a hot air balloon with black and white glasses looking over the edge uh, down onto the floodplain. And you'll notice uh, several things, uh, but let me first point out that uh, this is a forested floodplain. There's not many forested floodplains left around Puget Sound where you can demonstrate that the forest composition is virtually identical to what it was like in 1880 when it was first surveyed. We've repeated the surveys that the government land office did in the 1880s, and we come up with virtually the same vegetation distribution. This is almost an intact floodplain. Why is it preserved, and why is it the only one around Puget Sound we can find in that state? Well, this is the, the buffer to the artillery practice range at Fort Lewis. Um, and in fact, if you look around the Western North America, some of the best preserved intact habitat anywhere is on military bases. Not the part they're actually bombing for their practice range, but for the buffer. Um, so this is an incredibly um, um, intact system. The, the Nisqually tribal lands are down, the nation is down here at the bottom, Fort Lewis at the top, and this is essentially the border. And you'll notice all these black J's and the little black blobs that are by, by it. Those black J's are meant to call your attention to, to the black blobs right next to them, which are log jams, thus the J. Um, and you'll notice that this jam here, for example, that the, well, the river runs about like this today, 
But there's all these side channels that run off through the woods. And if you trace them back up to their head, they're about places where log jams blocked off an old channel of the river, kicked the river off in a different direction. Here's a beautiful wide one of the main channel used to go through there. It got blocked there and kicked over that way. These big logs that were, that were big enough to be stable when they fell into a river or enough to essentially collect other debris, dam the river, and throw it off to another place in the floodplain. Um, you can think of those little dams, the kind of dams you would have loved to have make as it made as a kid, where you could just block the river, send it off somewhere else. These big trees were doing that naturally. And if you then think about, well, where's the best salmon rearing habitat along a river like this? Where would you go if you were a juvenile fish during a flood? These, you know, our rivers and streams in the northwest are flood prone, they're disturbance prone. Uh, and if you're a fish that is, you know, a few inches long and you're in a river that's flowing at one to three meters per second as rivers do in flood, you're not going to be able to hold your position. You stay in the river, you're going to be down in salt water, but you're a freshwater fish. That's a death sentence. Well, what else could you do? You could burrow down to the riverbed. Well, when the flood comes up, that's when the gravel moves. That's also a death sentence. That's a sushi-making machine down the, on the bed of a river during a flood. Um, you could, well, you could snuggle up to the banks. That's one strategy. Or you could just go into these side channels where the, you, know, you have essentially still water even during the floods in the main stem because you have a log jam blocking it and metering the flow into it. It's the ideal salmon rearing habitat for the winter during which time you'd expect that there to be big disturbances. Um, well, what happened to all those side channels historically when we pulled the wood debris out of rivers around the northwest? Well, they disappeared. This shows you the still Guamish River uh, in Washington. It's the floodplains against another vertical aerial photograph looking down in the floodplain. You notice it's mostly agricultural land because floodplains make tremendous agricultural land. And all these white lines running through here are old channels of the river we can document from the 1870s surveys or from early aerial photographs. The main channel, though, is just a single thread that runs about like that. None of these other side channels still exist. None of them hold water. And if there's one thing that is required to create fish habitat, it has to be underwater. Um, I've yet to meet anybody who will argue the contrary. Um, and so how big a change were these changes in salmon habitat due to the replumbing of rivers around Puget Sound? I haven't done similar work in Oregon, so I can't comment on that, but I've done many of the rivers around Puget Sound, or my team at the University of Washington has. And this shows you the extent of historical changes in salmon habitat along the Skagit River north of Seattle, between Seattle and Vancouver. 1870s over there on the left, uh, year 2000 is there on the right, and what I want to advertise first off is that these maps have the identical color legend on them. On the left, you see the, the earth tones or uh, estuarine environments, uh, scrub shrubs or salty brackish water habitat. The blue is freshwater habitat. The green are, are mature forests along the channels. Um, near 2000, you, this little scrap of estuarine habitat down here is the largest piece of estuarine habitat left around Puget Sound. Um, you'll notice that there's not much left of the freshwater marshes, the off-channel habitat. It's all been ditched, drained, and diked, um, and is now used to, to grow other things. Um, but it's not serving as fish habitat. What we found in doing this same kind of historical change analysis around all the rivers of Puget Sound is that we see similar stories of huge losses of side channels and valley bottom wetlands along most of the major rivers, but the story for each individual river is unique. This shows you the lower Snohomish River, the town of uh, uh, Ever uh, Edmonds and Everett are, are sitting up in here. It's the um, I-5 runs up about through there today. Uh, you'll notice again that there's a lot more color on the map on the left in 1870 than there is on the right. How big a change is that for all the rivers and streams? Uh, well, we were able to actually integrate that data up to quantify how much habitat's been lost. How did we do it? Well, we looked at the historical records, the survey notes. I had a PhD student learn how to read 19th century cursive writing, which he's still not happy about. Um, but the original surveyors that came through the Northwest did an incredible job of actually documenting what was here, what they found. And so what we did is we basically remapped that, uh, reinterpreted it. You, they even have descriptions of how deep the flow was in different seasons. And we could use that to estimate the total area of uh, water that was inundated for different rivers in different periods of time. We could see how much area of channel there was, how much tidal uh, um, habitat there was, um, and how much seasonal uh, habitat there was. 
When we do that for the four big rivers along uh, northern Puget Sound, the Nooksack, the Skagit, the Stillaguamish, and the Snohomish, and we do it for 1870, and we do it for the year 2000, um, and we just look at it in total area that's inundated, total area that's underwater, total area that a fish might live in. Um, we've lost about 90% of the habitat. I mean, it physically does not exist anymore. Um, we've also lost about 90% of the fish around Puget Sound. Now, are those numbers a coincidence? Um, was it overfishing that actually did it, or was it the hatcheries? Well, you know, sure, you can always argue coincidence, but I, I, I suspect that it's not coincidental. I think that the direct loss of an equivalent amount of habitat relative to the amount of fish loss is sort of too striking a result to sort of dismiss as coincidence. Um, well, this condition was actually forecast about a century ago by a guy named Livingston Stone, who uh, was a, a president of the American Fishery Society, who in an address in 1892 wrote that provide some refuge for the salmon and provide it quickly. He was basically commenting on the potential decline of salmon in the Northwest based on what he saw happen in his home state of Maine in the 19th century. Um, so he wrote that uh, provide some refuge for the salmon and provide it quickly before complications arise which may make it impracticable or at least very difficult. If we procrastinate and put off our rescuing mission too long, it may be too late to do any good. After the rivers are ruined and the salmon gone, they cannot be reclaimed. All the power of the United States cannot restore salmon to the rivers after the work of destruction has been completed. Stone was kind of a, as you might guess, sort of a pessimistic guy. Um, he was basically arguing that salmon and civilization were mutually incompatible. And he was recommending that the U.S. government set up salmon sanctuaries where people would not be allowed so that the fish could actually hang on while we um, civilized the continent. Um, and I actually reject his conclusion because I think we could actually share the landscape with salmon and bring back commercially viable salmon fisheries throughout the Northwest, but we're certainly not going to do it the way that we've been doing it in the past. Th that experiment has been run. And in writing King of Fish, I thought really hard about, well, what might, you, what might one recommend um, as a strategy? And for the area around Puget Sound, it was actually fairly simple to me because the big floodplains are the places that were the juvenile salmon factories in the, in the past. And they're actually areas that periodically are inundated. They go underwater. They are, in fact, floodplains, and they're very well named. And we spend an, an awful lot of money today subsidizing floodplain-based activities around Puget Sound for land uses that are incompatible with being, being periodically submerged, which is what floodplains do. So I basically suggested that one of the few strategies that could work over the long run would be to create a network of salmon sanctuaries by restoring forested river corridors along major river floodplains. This is not to use Livingston Stone's uh, model of basically kicking people out of whole watersheds and giving them to the fish, but it's thinking about, well, how might we be able to actually be able to share the landscape in a way that produces enough fish that we can actually eat them? Um, well, this idea hasn't gone over terribly well, uh, in part because floodplains are uh, still being actively urbanized around Puget Sound. It's sort of flat, relatively easily developable land. Um, but there are big changes to the hydrology that happens when you do urbanize. Um, and, and that changes the way that water moves across the land, and that can turn the pre-urbanization 10-year flood, a flood that happened on average every 10 years with a 1 in 10 chance in any given year, into a post-urbanization annual flood, a flood you could expect every single year. Um, and if you think about the salmon's adaptation to disturbance in their environments, they were pretty good at, at surviving a one out of ten year flood because they had a couple generations of fish in the marine environment. But a major flood that could scour out their eggs that were developing the gravel that happens every year, they are simply not adapted to. And what happens when we urbanized uh, watersheds around Puget Sound? Uh, this is one of the few data slides that I'll, I'll show you tonight, and it basically was an undergraduate thesis that Amy Moskrip did with me back in the 1990s, where what she did is she looked at plotting up the discharge, the amount of flow in a river in, in, in Julian, uh, Juanita Creek, uh, a creek uh, over on the east side of Seattle, that was developed in the 1970s and 80s, and she looked at the frequency, the recurrence interval, how often a particular discharge happened either before urbanization or after, because this is a place where the U.S. Geological Survey had kept good records of the discharge through the period in which the watershed developed. And you'll notice it's a weird access down here. Don't worry about uh, uh, that. But essentially, the, what you can see is that the before 10-year discharge, so a 10-year flood, a flood that would happen one out of every 10 years, a good-sized flood, from before actually became 
something that happened every year or two after urbanization. In other words, this infrequent, fairly high disturbance event became a predictable regular occurrence. And essentially what we saw was that in the rivers that had undergone this kind of change, a salmon stream became a trout stream. Why? Well, the salmon essentially were spawning in the fall when we, when we got a lot of our rain, and so their eggs were in the gravel during the time the floods actually happened. Trout were spawning in the spring, and they put their eggs that developed in the gravel when we didn't get much rain, so they were immune from the effect. Um, so there's a fairly fundamental shift in the biology of streams that we see as a result of the physical hydrology, the geologic changes that accompanied urbanization around Puget Sound um, that would lead one to think that, well, maybe we ought to think about how we develop if we want to preserve salmon runs in the, into the future. And a, if you look at the population in the Northwest through time, there's no hint on this graph that suggests that the human population on Puget Sound is going to sort of magically drop off in the near future. And so what I was arguing to my colleagues and to policymakers in Washington was that we need to figure out strategies where we can accommodate the increased growth of the human population around Puget Sound and still bring our salmon back. I mean, that's the challenge. If we basically come up with sort of the idea that, oh, we'll just like seal the borders and have all the people disappear, it's just not going to happen, even if anybody would want it to. It's just crazy talk. Um, but, so how, but by the same token, if we ignore the footprint of future human development, we're going to lose the rest of our salmon. To argue otherwise, I believe, is equally crazy talk. How do you accommodate both is the real challenge. And I find far too few people in my home state actually recognizing that as the, the real issue. In fact, the Puget Sound Partnership a few years ago, back in 2006, I believe it was, came up with recommendations for restoring Puget Sound by 2020 and saving salmon around Puget Sound by 2020, which is you know, approaching fairly rapidly now. Um, and they essentially ignored, they explicitly ignored the potential adverse impacts likely to occur due to future development. That very hydrologic change that I was showing on the last few slides, which is fairly solid. Studies in three different research groups have confirmed the same kind of results. Um, and so you have a case where, you know, I don't understand how you can um, uh, acknowledge the potential for impacts, but then sort of just not deal with them in devising a solution. In fact, if you actually look at the Puget Sound Partnerships report, and you read past the executive summary, you read past the part the politicians signed, and you read the technical appendix of the scientific working group on page 43, it says the strategies listed are not likely to be sufficient to achieve ecosystem goals. In other words, this plan won't work. It's right there in the plan. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I was amazed that it's, it's in there, um, but as far as I can tell, it's actually an accurate statement. Um, and this leads me to you know, a, a different conclusion. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it reminds me about, you know, how much have we really learned from the history of England and from New England. Uh, and, you know, we are in many ways repeating the experience of, um, of previous areas. And just so you don't think that the sort of the hydrologic change is the only issue where we're not using fully what we know about the impacts to downstream areas, I think the, the caption up above and the photograph speak for themselves about a little cognitive dissonance might be going on in, in Washington. Um, and uh, this, this uh, photograph that actually circulated fairly widely uh, is, I think, a good example of that. This, this slope was inspected and found to have no potentially unstable slopes. Clearly, uh, there are a few instabilities that developed after the, uh, um, that fact in, in, admittedly, a very, very large storm. But the simple recognition that there were no potentially unstable slopes, there's demonstrably false because the slopes actually failed. Um, and just, uh, there was a um, statement, st st a spokesperson for the Washington State DNR that after this event basically argued, well, who could have predicted it? Well, unfortunately, the uh, DNR basically uh, had supported my research group to create a model to uh, predict the effects of timber clearing on the potential for landsliding um, uh, that we then ran on that site. So if you look at this view here, you're essentially looking from over here at this slope here. What we did with this is a fairly simple model. You take digital topography, you basically assume rain is falling on it, you route the water downslope, and you basically see how wet is the ground as a result of that water moving, and you know, what is the strength of the soil, how deep is the soil, what are the strength of the roots that are contributing to holding the soil on the slope, and you put in values that are pertinent to, in this case, for mature timber, 
and in this case for a uh, roughly about a five to ten year old clear cut and you'll notice that the, the red area, the red and the orange are areas where we'd predict would be vulnerable to sliding in a decent storm and you know there's, there's a bit of a difference between the mature timber and the clear cut case that is rooted so quite simply in basic physics um, but so you should never ask the question who could have predicted something to someone who you've actually supported to do that. Um, whether or not one actually uses models like that in setting policy, of course, is not a scientific issue. That's a policy call. And it's very legitimate when you could, you know, any policy is legitimate in the world of politics. But in the world of, in the world of science, uh, we'd like to think at least that the kind of things that we could develop would um, be considered it's part of that process and not just sort of dismissed with well who could have predicted it so this is actually the slide that I want to uh, come close to ending with uh, because in you know I'm a, I'm a scientist by training um, I've, I'm trained to look at the world through these kind of horrendograms because you know when you look at it, it everything really is connected to everything else it's just which are the important connections is often the hard thing to figure out um, but if you look at the history of salmon management particularly in the 20th century I would argue to you that, you know, in many cases, we are not really limited by our knowledge. You know, I've made the mistake of suggesting to some uh, colleagues that what we really need is not necessarily more research on the way that geomorphic processes influence salmon habitat, but which is kind of crazy because I make my living doing that. Um, of course we need more research, but I don't think that's been the key limiting step. If you look back at, at the history part, what, how we have used the knowledge that we have, whether it was in England, whether it was in New England, or whether it's in the Northwest today. We don't come anywhere near close to, I think, effectively using the information that we have at our collective disposal, and that it's managing the human dimension of the problem. How we live, where we live, the kind of rules we make, how we uh, um, essentially plan or try and prevent uh, outcomes that we don't uh, desire and I, and I was not able to find any record of anyone sort of you know intentionally d d um, wanting to d trigger decline of, of salmon populations. Indeed, people have wanted to use them intensively or less intensively at in various times and places. Um, but managing that human dimension of the problem, looking at the history, is something that I think that too many scientists don't recognize as perhaps the most important and limiting aspect of long-term natural resource management. Um, it can be very easy to basically say that, oh, we just need to do some more research to figure out the answer. But if we never use the research we've done in the setting the answers, that's really kind of a disingenuous argument. Um, so my point here is that we need both. We need to understand how the world works, but we also need to understand how societies work how we influence our environment and how that then in turn influences how the environment might help support our populations or not. Um, and that brings up the topic of my other book, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations, which is really a history of agriculture and a look at how erosion and the way we've treated agricultural lands has in effect limited the longevity of human societies time and time again. Um, and I'll make a short uh, plug for my new book, The Rocks Don't Lie, A Geologist Investigates Noah's Flood, that is a uh, look at the origin of the world's flood stories and the way that, that geology and Christianity have influenced each other over the centuries. Too, all too often one simply hears about the conflict between science and religion in public discourse, and I wanted to look at the way they've cross-pollinated and influenced each other. And this book took me an extra two years to write because the more I got into it, the more I found it's a really interesting story um, that's not the standard story that we hear about conflict. Um, of course that's out there um, and that's actually uh, um, a real story, but there's another, perhaps more interesting story about the way they've influenced each other. And I should probably stop there, um, but I thank you for your attention. I'd be glad if there's time to try and answer any questions that you might have. So let's take a couple minutes for a few questions and then we'll take it out to the lobby. Does anybody have any questions? The uh, Coquille Valley is about 91% pasture land now that were tied lands at one time, and they want to put it back into tidal lands. <coughs> and the movement is to do that. So it's going to affect a lot of farmers and saltwater intrusion and a few other things, but it probably will help the salmon. Yeah, there's, um, 
there's one project that I've seen on the Nisqually River in the Nisqually Delta where there was a, uh, a homestead that had been a farm for about 70 years that had, uh, they pulled the levee system out a couple years ago. And the speed of the, the marsh recovery there is just amazing. You know, the, the, the trade off of whether you're better off using that land as farmland or as fish production land or, or habitat land, that's a question that in my own mind sort of really depends on the local situation and context. If you have a ton of fish, maybe you need the farmland a lot more. And if you're desperate for fish, maybe you'd make the trade off. That's a real political call. But I've seen places where that kind of project can actually work. Okay, back in the, back in the old days, how does salmon handle beaver dams? And also, uh, how effective are salmon fish ladders on modern day dams? Um, the uh, fish ladders were invented, I think, in about 1805 or 6 by a Scottish guy. And uh, they work really well on low head dams. And as far as I know, the fish ladders for getting salmon over the dams work pretty darn well. Um, I don't, I've never worked on one, haven't designed one, so you know, take that answer with a grain of salt. But I haven't run into a whole lot of um, uh, hand wringing about the getting fish, o mature fish over the dams being a big problem. It's often getting the juvenile fish down that's the problem, particularly for, for uh, some of the big ones. Uh, as far as beaver dams go, there's, I've got colleagues who've essentially argued that the beaver dams formed incredibly good salmon habitat. Um, and they were not, they were, um, they're not really high head dams. They're fairly low for the most part. Some of them were probably tall enough that you might have had, they might have been a fish passage barrier. But a lot of the um, natural log jams that I have worked on um, uh, are kind of leaky. They have sort of like steps. They're not sort of a massive barrier. Some of them, some of them are. But many of them, uh, I've, I've seen fish on the upstream side of where you, if you just stand back and look at the face, you wonder how they get over it. Then you get up and into it, uh, or some of them have actually fallen through and into there. There's ways to get in and through them as a fish. Um, so it's, my suspicion is, is that on a whole, the beaver dams historically actually created pretty good rearing habitat for salmon in many, many uh, rivers and floodplains. But I'm sure there are places where they would, for some period of time, block salmon access. Are there any good stats on, uh, st on splash dams and how much of a factor they were? Um, you know, I don't know of any really good stats. I, ha I do have a couple historical sources that show sort of the extent of them. And in some places, like parts of the Oregon Coast Range and southwestern Washington in particular, it looks like they were pretty much everywhere. And from what I can tell by what they, the historical descriptions of, of the, the, the dam bursting and the few places where I've seen photographs of actual log drives, um, they you know, to get a log drive down a dam, you had to basically pull all the obstructions. It had to be clean. That's a recipe for scouring down to bedrock. And I did a lot of work in the Oregon Coast Range in the 90s looking at why there's so many bedrock channels in the coast, in the coast range. And I'm completely convinced that that's not the natural state of the rivers in the region, and that uh, historically there were probably you probably had logs damming and trapping alluvium in sort of a stair step way, sort of a you know one to a couple meter high um, steps, um, and because if you look at the the well the profiles are pretty steep for um, but it, there's wrote a couple papers on it, but I'm pretty sure that, well, I'm, I'm sure that my opinion is that they were historically much more uh, wood and gravel rich than one has, tends to find them today. Can you give us any names of organizations or individuals that uh, share some of your historical reference to this problem? Um, you know, I don't know a lot in terms of organizations that are looking at the history. Um, there's, there's a number of books that have been written on it. Uh, most of the ones that I'm aware of, I cite, so they're all listed in the sources at the back of King of Fish. Um, you know, in terms of organizations that work on rivers nationally, um, that have, you know, a historical bent, but are, are really focused on restoring rivers. Um, I'm on the science advisory board for a group called American Rivers, whose work I, I really respect a lot. And again, I'd like to thank all of you for showing up tonight, and also Dave, who's going to have an early flight out tomorrow. But thank you all for coming. And if you're interested in getting those references, 
the lecture series is selling copies of Dave's book, King of Fish, out in the lobby afterwards for $25, cash or check. So thank you again all for coming out tonight. Hopefully we'll see you in April. Thank you.